Right, we're now recording. Um, so just be aware that it's being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Council's YouTube um, after the meeting as well. Um, and yeah, anybody is uh, able to take pictures or, or their own recordings if they want. It is a public meeting. Um, so just yeah, be aware of that. Um, and yeah, stay on mute if you can, if you're not speaking. Um, if you do feel comfortable having your camera on, that is quite nice. So please um, do if you feel able. Um, well, obviously, there's no um, compulsion about that. If you'd rather not, that's fine too. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, kind of get cracking. So um, I'm just going to um, put the agenda up for a quick reminder about what we're going to be covering. One second. So, uh, hopefully everybody can see that. So, yeah, kind of welcome introductions. Um, and um, we have started recording, so we've covered that bit. Um, before we go any further, I'll quickly introduce um, council um, officers that we've got with us tonight. Um, so we have got Danny Kilbride from Housing. Um, Danny wants to give a wave. Um, we've got um, Louise Besant from um, um, Street cleaning. We've got um, Maria Mancini, um, who is responsible for the um, new testing site we've got in the area. Um, and we've got also um, Dr. Mary O'Hara um, from Public Health as well. So that's who we've got here in the meeting tonight. Um, I'll, we are basically, um, I'll kick off with a few updates from me um, and what kind of I've been doing and what's going on, a few things that have been flagged to me. Um, I was then, depending on what people want to cover um, or what people are most um, uh, exercised about, I was going to um, either go to COVID-19 in Birmingham or kind of do housing and then flower tipping. So it depends what um, people's appetite is. Um, can I just get from those who are participating um, what, if there's any particular preference or anything you'd like to spend more time on, um, particularly um, in the meeting. Not seeing any particular expressions anybody wants to put in the chat? No? Okay. All right. So in that case, um, I might say, so let's just go straight to the, I'll go to items, um, I'll do my update first, and then we'll, we'll then go to item six and then do items four and five. Um, so in terms of update from me, um, most of my work recently has been, a lot of it has been um, fairly high number of case work quite queries, a lot of housing sort of case queries, um, things like, um, well, my, I've got this repair or that heating's broken, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of rehousing queries I've had recently, um, since, since Christmas particularly, a lot of those housing queries have, have been coming in. Um, so I've spent quite a lot of time on that. Um, in kind of um, central council kind of land, it's been budget time. Um, so the council's passed its annual budget. So that's taken up a little bit of time as well in terms of uh, responding to that and, and um, kind of engaging with that. Um, the bigger, other bigger issues that I've been kind of working on as, as well as kind of casework stuff have been, um, there's a currently quite, um, ongoing issue in kind of the Lindsworth area of the ward. So that's kind of the northwest part of the ward um, where there's quite a lot of residents on kind of Lindsworth Road and um, kind of Petlin's Way and, and that sort of Midhurst Road and that sort of area where there's been ongoing issues with the noise from the specialty minerals factory, um, which is on, on Lifford Lane, just the side of the canal. Um, and that's been causing quite a lot of issues with um, noise disturbance and, and residents you know, struggling to get a good night's sleep and it disturbing people during the day as well, people at home a lot more knocked down. So um, that, that's been um, a really big one. 
Um, anybody who's got a particular um, interest in that one, um, particularly from that part of the ward, you've got a special meeting on that issue, particularly um, on the 22nd of March. So we've got council um, environmental health um, uh, coming along to that, along with environment agency, and hopefully the factory as well, um, to speak to residents and, and engage with residents on that um, issue. Um, sorry, I'm just admitting somebody else from the waiting room. Um, so that um, is on Monday, the 22nd of March, we'll have that, that public meeting. Um, and yeah, so we'll really kind of go into that on that day um, and really try and um, kind of try and, try and see some progress on that. It has been quite a long going, going issue. Any other kind of major thing um, that people have raised quite a bit recently is um, the British Legion and what's going on with that. Um, so I've been trying to do some digging as councillor and writing to council property services a little bit to try and get some answers because a lot of residents have been seeing work going on outside it. Um, I'm wondering what's going on and there's rumours flying around it's going to be a pub or it's going to be this or it's going to be that. Um, so the, in terms of the Legion, the council owns the land, but it's on a long term lease. Um, so there's limits to how much control the council's got, but the lease is on... Um, basically, it's, it was leased for the purposes of doing a, of, of having a social club or having a, a British Legion. Um, so, if they're going to majorly change that, they need to speak with the council. And also, from a planning perspective, the council is the, is the planning authority. That's the, the organisation that gives planning permission. Um, so, from that perspective, it also has to, you know, oh, you know, give planning permission for change of uses as well. Um, and if it was going to open a pub there, there'd also have to be a licensing application. So none of those things have, have happened. Um, there hasn't been any planning application, there hasn't been any licensing application. And in terms of the council, the landlords, in terms of property services, they haven't really been approached to have any discussion about that either. Um, so what um, the current leaseholders are saying is they, the work that they're doing at the moment is to secure the site and to kind of build a bigger fence and, and keep it more secure. Um, and that's all they're kind of really sharing at this point. Um, despite multiple emails so far, I've not been able to get anything more than that. They you know, have medium and long-term ideas, but they're not sharing that yet. Um, I'm not letting that one drop. I'm gonna try and get a bit more information if I can, but so far the line is that they are securing the site. That's the work that's ongoing at the moment. There's no other short-term thing planned. Um, and we don't know yet what, what their intentions are, um, kind of long, medium and long term at the moment, although we, I am still trying to get that information. So that's the latest on the Legion, um, really. So just to kind of give that information, um, I will obviously update on social media if anybody who's not been able to make the meeting tonight as well. Um, so that's kind of it from me. Um, in terms of um, the, the, the bigger things from, from my side of things. Uh, so it, I'll now move, I'll probably now then kind of do the COVID stuff um, and ask Mary to do a bit of an update on um, where we are with COVID in Birmingham, um, generally kind of stats, figures, and kind of vaccination um, progress and testing um, and any other information things might be useful. Um, and then Maria is going to specifically talk about the testing centre in, in our area as well and, and give you a bit of a, um, information about that. So, um, and then there'll be an opportunity for, for any, any questions on those two things. So, uh, Mary, over to you. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'm Mary O'Reary. I'm a, a public health doctor at um, Birmingham City Council. I'll just give a, a, a brief update on, on covid um, from a number of perspectives, and, and, um, and I'm sure I, I can take any questions or, or have questions sent on if you, if you have them later. Um, so, if we start from our, our city position at the moment uh, as a place to start, we, the rate of um, COVID, so these are people who've tested positive in the last seven days, and we do it based on 100,000, just so that we can compare ourselves with smaller places, bigger places, or even indeed within the city. And our rates at the moment are 120. Now that is really, really good news. In recent weeks and months, it has been so much higher than that. 
Um, I was trying to recall when last it was in this region and it would be going back to before the beginning of the last school term. Um, so that's, that's really good news. Um, obviously we want rates to continue to fall. Um, they're not falling as fast as we'd like. And so I would um, thank you all for being vigilant and complying with the restrictions that we have in, in the national lockdown. But I would ask you to continue because we're not there yet. Um, so just to provide a bit of context so that to be sort of understand what, what, what does that mean? Um, so from a regional perspective, um, the, the, the top areas are sort of Sandwell, Stoke on Trent. Birmingham is round about the middle, about the same sort of level as Wolverhampton. Um, and if we look at core cities, so we compare ourselves sometimes with places like Liverpool and Bristol and you know, Manchester, Nottingham, we're sort of the middle of the pack. So we're not doing badly. Um, if we come more locally, what does that mean? What's the comparison? Now, obviously, we're only about just under 12,000 population in the ward, but we still base it on 100,000 for comparison. So we know how we compare. And I'd say for Drew's Heath and Bonehill, it's around about 93. So certainly you're doing better than Birmingham average. Um, obviously we still want that to come down. And that's 93 per 100,000 means that in the last seven days, you've had 11 cases, 11. But that's still 11 cases that if we could avoid, we'd want to. Um, and so I will, I'll come on to a bit of what some of the things that we need to do. I've got to repeat the, the same old things of before. If you've got symptoms, get tested. Um, but also, if you have to go out to work in this time of national lockdown, so your work is essential, it requires you to leave the home. There is testing for people who are asymptomatic and who want that assurance that they um, don't have COVID and they're not picking it up. And we'd be encouraging people to take that up maybe a couple of times a week. So maybe every three, four days. Um, asymptomatic testing has been rolled out. There is, there are certain fixed sites, but there are also, we've got hundreds of pharmacies that are coming on stream. And the last count, and I should have this number to hand, the last count, we were not quite at the hundred, but we are close to that. So the idea is that there will be a community pharmacy somewhere close to you where you can go get tested. And we've worked with them to make sure that the hours they're open means that it improves access for everyone. But that's for people who are not symptomatic, but just want to be to check and get that assurance that they don't have it. For people who are symptomatic, we would still say, as soon as you're symptomatic, stay home. Um, you know, order a test sent to you or go to one of our set types. We have two mobile uh, drive through sites and we have um, another 10 walk through sites that you can go to. So that's what we do about testing. Contact tracing is the next thing. So I would encourage as many of you as are willing to um, sign up to the NHS Test and Trace app. It will tell you not just things for yourself when you might be positive, but it, particularly it will tell you when you've been around someone else who is positive. In addition to the NHS Test and Trace app and, and the system that the NHS Test and Trace will make calls, et cetera, we have something locally that we are supplementing, we are augmenting that. We call it case tracing. And what we do is if there are people who perhaps haven't responded in the first 24 hours or so, we will then make local contact with them. And we're finding that that's pretty successful. We are reaching more than half of those people. Um, it allows us to then get information about where they've been. Yes, advise them to isolate, but also that we can check how they are for welfare. What, you know, are they okay to isolate? Do we need to signpost to any assistance? So things like isolation payments. Um, a lot of this information you can get on the BCC website. Um, and if you've got any difficulties, if there's anything that's not clear, please feed that back to us because there's always scope for us to improve that. That leads me on to transmission. So at the moment, the main mode of transmission um, for COVID for most people seems to be household contact. Now that means one person gets COVID and then another person gets COVID within that home. Now, Household uh, transmission within households is not inevitable. 
Um, I appreciate that it can be difficult in some instances to say, well, this person's got COVID, can we protect everyone else? But there is a really good site called Germ Defence that gives practical tips about how in your homes, in your own households, you can organise things so that if one person is positive, not everyone else in the household has to get it. Um, so that's a bit of that household transmission. The second mode of transmission that we're getting is obviously in the workplace. Now we're still in national lockdown. So people who are going out to work at the moment are the people who have to go out to work by the nature of their work. Um, and we, we appreciate that we've been asking people to be vigilant and careful for about a year now, but we do have to continue to be vigilant um, because we're finding that it's the little lapses in concentration, um, which is where people are getting um, exposure and transmission. So for many people who go to work, they're really vigilant for 99% of the time, and then they'll go out for lunch, um, or they will um, car share and forget that actually it's still part of the exposure. So I, I'd say, you know, it's the same things about distancing and hand washing and not touching your face and wearing a face covering, um, but we do have to be vigilant. Next thing I wanna to touch on is COVID champions. So our COVID champions are um, basically members of our community who um, wish to be part of making this whole experience the best that we can make it. So we, we, we work with our COVID champions to say, well, we'll give you the latest information about COVID-19. Um, we'll invite you to exclusive webinars with topic experts. We, COVID champions then share this information with anyone in their community um, and anyone in their network in whatever way they want. Some people will talk about it, others put it on social media. As long as it adheres with government guidelines, they share that information in the confidence that it is from an identifiable source, it's, it's genuine, it's sound information. What we also do is we ask the champion, the, the champions get a chance to ask us questions on behalf of their community. So what we're asking champions to do is to bring back to us the questions that want to be raised from their network, from their family and friends, and let us know what is and what isn't working. So um, at the moment we, we need at least one more champion in the ward for us to have a representative number. So we're, we're aiming for 10, for a thousand in the first instance. We then want to go to 1500. But what I'm also looking at is not just the number we have for the whole city, but how many do we have in each ward so that each ward has a representative proportion. Um, and then after that, we'll look at representation in, in other ways. So at the moment, we'd like, we, we need one more person to sign up to be a, a COVID champion. And that would be really great because that would get us the number we need for, for this ward. Um, last but not least is that we have vaccination underway. Um, now this is not something that's run by the local authority. It's run by the NHS and they've got a brilliant, they've done really brilliantly. They've got a website on the Birmingham Solar Health CCG um, which gives lots of information. But I just thought you might want to know that where, where we are with our uptake in the award. Um, and at the moment, I was looking at it earlier on today for the sort of, we started with the oldest people. So we started with people over 80 and then at people over 70 and we're working our way down. At the moment for people um, over 65, 69, we've got 86% who have had their first dose. So well done, um, that's really, really good. We, I wish I had that figure in every ward across the city, that is not the case, but you're in a really, really good position. Obviously that does mean that there are 15% of people or 14% of people who have been offered the vaccine who haven't yet taken it. Now we've had a number of events to tell people about the vaccine and to give them the opportunity to understand and make an informed choice. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue to put information out there to persuade. But if there's anyone listening or anyone you know of who has been offered a vaccine and at that time didn't wish to take it, but has now got second thoughts and they do want to take it, 
it's not too late. Just get get into get go go to the CCG website. The, the mechanisms are there. You let them know. Yes, I was offered the vaccine previously. Wasn't keen on it then, but I've changed my mind and I'd now like to have it. And that is an offer that that is open. So I think at that stage, I'd probably stop and take any questions if you have them. So um, any any questions from anyone on any of that? And thank you, Mary. That was that was really really useful and really really helpful. That was fantastic. Anybody got any anything? I'm not seeing any hands. Not seeing anything in the chat. Brilliant. I've got I suppose one which um, has been raised a couple of times. Um, uh, well, I've had a phone, you know a phone call and, and bits on social media about it. Is the actual location of of vaccination centres and getting to them. Um, and some people are struggling to get to the big ones, basically, and and kind of, um, you know, what about the local ones? And it, it seems to be a bit more of a struggle to get a slot at somewhere more local or to get it into, to, um, to be able to see more locally. So I suppose there's two questions on that. Um, what is the actual easy procedure to get one more locally if, if you prefer that? And I know that I think All Saints Church, Kings Heath was, was, was one of the closer ones. Um, and secondly, is there any, going to be anything any closer than that? Is there going to be anything in the ward or or um, anything, anything closer than, than the ones already? Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I totally get, Mary, that it's not on the council room service, but obviously you, you may have more information than we do on, on this one. I, right. <laughs> what I what I can do um, uh, and I'm happy to do is to take that back to our CCG NHS colleagues. Um, because I think it's a perfectly legitimate question, uh, quite reasonable. If there, if there are people who are struggling to get to what is currently on offer, I know that they are continuing to look at how they roll out offer. So they started with fixed sites that were big. Um, they're moving, they're starting to introduce some mobile sites. They are looking at doing communities in different ways. So sometimes it's a faith setting. Um, so they will look at what would work for that community. and. Uh, we are, as public health, we will be champions absolutely saying if there's a community or a segment of a community, any demographic that is disadvantaged and not able to access the vaccine that's on offer, we will be championing what solutions can be found. So I'm quite happy to take that back to, to our NHS colleagues and raise that. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've had a couple of those, which was like it was really difficult to get to or I don't know how to book one more locally or, or that sort of thing and it just um yeah I just want to make sure that we weren't missing a trick there in terms of that that take up um brilliant thank you um if there's no more direct questions for Mary I'll just quickly pass over to Maria to just talk about the local testing um available you know um center that we've got in 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 the patch Maria so hi good evening hi. my name is Maria um I'm actually now based at uh, Maypole Youth Center uh, where we opened yesterday the lateral flow uh, testing system. Um, we're available from 8 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m., um, seven days a week. Uh, we're encouraging as many local people as we can with, you know, within the area and further afield. Um, today we had someone come from Redditch, which I thought was quite a distance um, from, you know, from the Maypole itself um, to come to be tested. Um, we're just, like I said, encouraging as many people as we can. We've put banners up outside. You'll be able to see those. We've got them opposite the neighbourhood office. Uh, we've put them on the main road, on the Alcester Road. There's like a big yellow banner stretch there saying, you know, if you've got no symptoms, come to us so you can get tested. Um, today, we, um, we had some champion children um, that came uh, with Juliet Faulkner, who's senior youth worker there. Uh, they come to do some videos, some TikTok videos, so they can get the message over for when the children go back to school, you know, not to be afraid of it. Um, so overall, it was a real good day today. Um, you know, it was a real big achievement for some of those children that had never been uh, into a test centre, have never actually had the test. Um, they came with the parents too, and the, the parents actually supported them and they got tested as well. Brilliant, thank you, Maria. Um, any questions on that, about that? Um, oh, Rachel. Yeah, just to say, so was that uh, children that were symptomatic? No, it wasn't. No, okay, I was just, because uh, I, I, we've there's a family that we know that live around the corner from there. 
And their daughter really, really doesn't want to be doing the lateral flow testing when she goes back to school. And I've been trying to encourage them to do it. And I just wondered, you know, what you've said there was so, um, you know, inspiring that maybe if she could come round, is, is, that, is that how that's Absolutely. working? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So, um, you know, like I said, my name is Maria. I'm going to be there tomorrow as well. Uh, you know, the whole right. of my team are there. Uh, you know, we have up to 12 operatives there. Um, and really, you know, we want to encourage these children to show these children that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, we had a couple of children as well. Um, Julian um, came and did it in different languages as well for us so they could put it on videos to actually show the children some were, um, some obviously said it in uh, Arabic, some people said it in uh, Somali, uh, which was really, really good. It was, um, overall, I thought it was a real big success. So when it gets loaded, um, these children in these schools will be able to see it. But I think as well, if they come in and they they do feel a bit, um, you know, not not even isolated, but, but frightened to do the test, what we're actually saying is, um, we're making a bit of, um, you know, like a song and dance a bit where we say, no, choose your favorite nostril, you know, to, you know, to, to put to up there and have a tickle of your throat and things like that. So today, the girls that came, um, they they were, there was a family that came that, um, that were a bit frightened, um, but at the end of it, they came out all laughing, which was really, really good. And, and obviously, they were all negative as well. Yeah. And that's Maypole Youth Centre, is it? It is, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And they, they just turn up or they have to book or? No, not at all. There's no booking system. So like I said, we're open from eight o'clock till 6pm. No booking system okay. at all. You just literally just queue obviously two metres apart. You go into the registration um, foyer first to start with. Uh, we do the registration process with you and then we take you through step by step. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Brilliant. Thank you, Maria. That's that was really helpful. Um, any more any more questions on on to Maria or if anybody's now got anything else that, that's come up for, for Mary as well? Um, before before we move on, anything? No. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, brilliant. Yeah, I've just seen Mary's um, notice in the chat there as well um, on on workplace with fifty more. So yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you both for that. That's been really really useful. Um, and yeah. Um, if I get any more of those sort of queries um, and um, need more information, that I will I will be in touch. Um, and thank you very much. That's been that's been really helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, so now I'll um, probably yeah move on for a quick housing update from from Danny Kilbride, um, and then we'll kind of move on to the more um, talking about the more. Uh, yeah, fly tipping issue um, that's been rearing its ugly head um, quite a lot recently. So yeah, quick kind of non-fly tipping update from Danny, and then and then we'll we'll then move on to the actual meat of the fly tipping. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, very very quickly from me uh, because I, I assume there's not many people from housing here, uh, Julian. Um, just so while you're driving up and down Drewy Teeth, really, I, I cover Drewy Teeth, not the other side of the ward, uh, which is Bramwood, but I can answer any questions that, that's needed there. Uh, at the moment, we've got a lot of work going on in our tower blocks. Uh, you're probably all aware that we're actually bringing Brent in three, Saxelby, Barrett's and Kingswood. Saxelby's got one person in, but uh, Kingswood's got about seven or eight, and uh, Barrett's, we're going to start emptying probably the back end of April, if everything goes okay. Now, the rest of the blocks, what you'll see is that we're putting the sprinkler systems into all of the high rises within Drury Teeth within the next three months. I was in Belfield yesterday, uh, and so that's being done at the moment. And what that does is we actually put a sprinkler system into every room in every flat. So if there is a fire in the flat, immediately the sprinkler system kicks in uh, and calls the fire. I don't think it douses it, it actually calls it which assists with uh, smoke damage and things like that. So we are doing that. Uh, as you can imagine, that brings up a lot of problems of its own because we're having to knock every single door. Um, you know, we are finding funnies as, as we go into flats. Um, what it is as well, it, it's, it's very intrusive work. It's very loud. It's very noisy from 7.30 in the morning till 4 o'clock at night. So, so, you know, we are trying to get the message out there and, and apologise to people. Um, just going on to criminal damage, we are suffering a lot of criminal damage at the moment. Drew's house uh, one night last week had every single light on the landings kicked out. Now, 
the cost implication alone for me for that for Birmingham City Council is massive. But what's more important is if there was an incident in that block, people would have gone into a safe area, which is the stairwell, blind because it was pitch black. There are no windows. It would have been pitch black. And all that they've had to follow is the, the exit signs. We, we have got some names. We can't prove it to these people, but we are chasing them up. Um, what we do as well is we put letters out into that block to ask for anybody to come forward. Now, what, what a very quick one as well is at the moment in the south side of the city, we're actually carrying out um, reassurance phone calls. We, we came across a very vulnerable gentleman a few weeks ago, and um, I've got to be honest, I was very embarrassed that I hadn't noticed that he, that he was vulnerable. Uh, so what we've done is we've got all of our systems and we've put all two and a half, 23 and a half thousand names into the system. And we at the bottom, after we put special criteria in, like, is the person over 65? Has the person had any repairs? Is their gas tapped? Things like that. We've come out with about 850 names. Now, at the moment, we're ringing up all 850 of those people and just saying, are you OK? Do you need anything? Do you need anybody to visit? You know, have you got this? We've noticed this. And we're getting some really, really good results from that. You know, we're getting some really people are thanking us a lot and saying, yeah, I could do with. So so that's the housing. Uh, are you going to cover the regeneration, Councillor? Or... Um, I wasn't directly because at the moment it's kind of there's not much news at the moment other than what you said about rehousing. So I've, um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's still kind of, you know, discussions are happening between council and the community really is, is kind of where we're at with, with that. So um, there's nothing kind of, oh, this plan is here on this date yet sort of level of stuff at the moment. So yeah, hence why I hadn't really, it wasn't going into, into any, any more than that really. Um, thanks, Danny, that's helpful. Uh, um, just on, on, very quickly, Danny, on the um, sprinklers. So are they going in Hillcroft and Brookpiece as well, even though those are supposed to come down the next few years as well? Up county, especially Brook Peace, um, because of, of the way that you know it could be empty in 18 months' time. So, so that, that decision is being made by greater greater expertise than me. But yeah, I picked it up quite quickly as I did Hillcroft. I mean, I think it'll go in Hillcroft because Hillcroft's going to be two or three years. Um, so, so I, I've got a feeling it will go in Hillcroft. It, we're just deciding whether it's going in Barrett's. But like I say, I, I picked that up quite quickly, and I, I fed it up about three weeks ago. I think. It was it was a, a light bulb moment for me, and I thought, oh God, you know, um, do, do do we need to put it in there? So I I push that decision up, and it will be you know like I say made by bigger people than me. All right, if we if we can just go on to to fly tipping then, yeah. Just one question, one quick, just before we do, if any any anybody got any questions or or comments on what Danny said on on the more general housing update there. No, I'm not saying anything. Okay, well, yeah, so basically on the flight, I was going to basically say if you want to give a bit of an update of what you've been doing, what you've been finding, and then I'll, I'll ask the same from kind of Louise as well, and then I'll open it up. Okay, all right then. Um, fly, fly to me. So if you think, uh, I let, let's just say I, I own really most of the green spaces except the park in Druid's Heath. And, and, and I will be very honest with you, what I have to cover this fly tipping wise is I have a truck which carries a ton once a week. And on that truck, I can have four tipper tickets. Now, each tipper ticket I have costs £84 for me to dump. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is last week, I used 13 tipper tickets instead of four. So every week we are using at least 10 extra tipper tickets apart from the four that we already get to clear the ward of fly tipping. I'll be honest with you all now, and I'll be honest with everybody, I'm a beaten man with fly tipping. I, I can't keep up with it. Because after Grenfell, my priority every day is to clear the blocks of flats. So every day, or at least twice a week, I have to clear all the fly tipping away from the 13 or the 12 tower blocks that I have in Druid's Heath. So that may take up four or five tipper tickets each time I do it. We, we moved some from Pleck House the other day and it took nine tickets. That's nine times £84 to clear 
that block alone. Now, it wasn't the people in the block because there was a ball pit and a trampoline there. In all the will in the world, you ain't going to have a ball pit and a trampoline in your flat. So I know that was dumped from outside. Now, what we do is before we clear any fly tipping is we look around and we letter drop the addresses and we say, dob your neighbours in. If you know who's done this, you tell me and I'll get enforcement action. Of all the fly tipping I've list lifted in the last three years, we've got one enforcement action going through. That's all. This is a community issue. It's a community issue. And personally, I don't think the community is on board with it. And I am fighting a battle that I can never win. If I had 100 fly tipping tickets, I still wouldn't be able to clear it. Now, every time I spend £84 on lifting fly tipping, that £84 comes out of the housing revenue budget. That budget is to give people better properties, new windows, or improve things. So every time we take money out of there, something else suffers. And like I say, I, I have no solution to this. I will carry on lifting it, moving it, trying to get enforcements on people, sending letters out, advising people. I, that's all I can do. And, you know, like I say, um, my, my lads who, who have been working throughout the, the pandemic and are supposed to be on reduced hours be, to keep them safe are still out there at three, four o'clock in the afternoon after starting at six, clearing up fly tipping. So, so we are beaten. <laughs> and I will take advice and suggestions off anybody. Okay, thanks, Danny. So um, that's a useful overview in terms of what you've been doing and are faced with. Um, I'll kind of hand over to Louise to get her, um, yeah, what, what kind of street cleaning can do or um, is doing on this, and then we'll open it up for maybe some of those suggestions and some of that community solution uh, finding as well. Louise. Absolutely. Can I just apologise? I've got a horrible cold, so I might start sneezing. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, um, I just wanted to put what Danny was saying in context. It doesn't mean very much in isolation. So um, Birmingham has money to clean the street, it, things like that. And some years ago, artificially, it was carved off to go, well, that's housing, land and housing, worry about that. And it means nothing to residents, obviously, why would it? Um, and four years ago, myself and my direct, uh, assistant director, Darren, so I was brought in to go, can you make this make any sense? There are a number of issues around fly tipping with with Jewish uh, particularly, but Mony Hall as well, which is what your definition of fly tipping is. So what Danny's picking up every day and what draining his resources is stuff around a block. But actually, fly, the definition of fly tipping is something that's out on the street that hasn't got a collection attached to it, effectively. So if you put a fridge out to the front door and you haven't got somebody picking it up, that's fly tipping. That's true of everybody, it's true of everything. The blocks of flats that actually I need to struggle down. I've worked with Danny for a very long time, well, four years, but a very long time, is that actually, you know, we put things near bins, don't we? Because that makes sense to us. Um, and, and what happens with that is, because of the nature of the way that uh, an emergency vehicle has to get into a block, it means it's prime for environmental crime. So people can drive in, dump some stuff, knowing the bin men, and there are, 1,500 men and seven women will come and pick it up because eventually we will because it's a problem. But, 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 but we're not getting to the heart of the behaviour. So when Tani's talking about what's going on, it's the behaviour where, where we think it's okay to do that. And, and lots of our blocks were designed for dust. That's what they're called, dustmen. They're designed for dust. The, the chutes are this big because they, we, we were designed to burn our waste and then throw the dust away. Chutes aren't big enough. The bin rooms aren't big enough. It's people's behaviour that's got to change in some of this. Now, there is some hope on the horizon. It's been delayed because of COVID. In fact, well, everything's been delayed because of, my 50th birthday was delayed because of COVID. Because it's been, it has been delayed, but we won a million pounds last year to start going enough of this. That's private land, that's housing land, that's this, that's that. We just need people to, to, to lift and shift it and start looking at enforcement primarily. So who is doing this? How can we get the behaviour in the community to go, you're not doing that. We'll support you. We will work with you. 
So I, I personally won a million pounds, personally, as a service, won a million pounds to start tackling this, the root of it, which is enforcement. Can we put cameras up? Can I actually serve notice? I love that Danny sends letters, and Danny knows I, I kind of wave him a lot going, don't send a letter. The letter doesn't do very much, actually, because the letter might be served on a property. Three months later, somebody else lives there. There's, there's particular things about that. So, so this million pounds, which you're going to start spending, I know literally hot off the press, my cabinet members briefing yesterday, at the end of this month, will be recruiting a specific team that will not look at issues around private land because we've got issues with private land, little alleyways behind houses that aren't necessarily owned, around blocks of flats, housing land particularly, where in, it, historically it's always been, that's not our land, that's yours. And he will tell you that we've had lots of arguments about that's not my land, that's your land. But actually all people are interested in the fact that there's some fire tipping. So the Love Your Street, which is what it's called, has got money to not only tackle fly tipping, but look at cleaner, greener improvements like things particularly around graffiti, working with our partners to make sure that our environments are a little bit better than they are. And, and I don't know if your residents know much about street team because it sounds a very odd word, um, but street team manages everything from the, 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 the nature conservation centre, so red pandas, um, uh, street cleansing, waste management, um, Chelsea Flower Show, Parks and Gardens, 591 Park, so it's a massive um, and, and um, mowing and all, all sorts of things and planting. So street scene is quite it's a really big portfolio. And me and Darren were brought in, as I said, four years ago, start going, we've got to get rid of these artificial lines. <laughs> so uh, say, so start looking at how we improve that. I've been really clear that I want to work with residents because only you lot are living with it. And and I know I, I know that I'm from the south of Birmingham. I know the area really well. And I know that it's lots of tiny little things. Historically, Birmingham's the one size fits all. This is what's happening in Allen Rock, and that's what's going to happen in Druid Heath. We are 69 villages. We have very different, you have very different needs for Druid Heath than, than let's say Allen Rock. Now, just to give you some facts, because it was a bit depressing what Danny said, sorry, Darren, but it was. You had 204 cases last year of fly tipping. The average is about 1,200. So you're doing all right, actually, in terms of, it's not brilliant. I'd rather nobody fly tip, but in very real terms, it, it's not what it is. And, 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 I, and I suspect that's because what I see as fly tipping and what, and what somebody else will see as fly tipping is a very subjective term. So you might see something at the bottom of a tower block that you think is by tipping, but actually it's due to be collected that day or the next day, in which case it's not. So there, is some, there is some subjectivity that's going on in that. One of the things that we're launching in the next two months, hopefully, um, if we're allowed to, because it's all about communities working together and whether that's allowed to by the government, is, is, is a land audit management survey where residents can actually audit their own environment and tell us as a local authority what's going on and what we can do with that. And streets are you know, going to respond by working with our partners in highways, our partners in housing, our partners in, in, in um, tenant um, and um, private landlords and certainly HMO across the city, which is a, a bigger thing, and our police and antisocial behaviour and community safety partnership friends in order to make sure that some of this stuff actually just gets a little bit joined up. I might do something one day, I might do something another day. Actually, what we want is all that done on the same day. So, so we, we, there's a lot of things going on. A lot of it's been delayed. <laughs> and I'm sorry about that, but it has been. And um, but, but there's some hope uh, in the future. What I would ask from you and, and certainly from your residents is to start telling us where those problem areas are. Start telling us who you know who is jumping telling us so we can put the cameras in the right place we can send enforcement to the right shops we can uh, actually harness quite a finite resource and Danny's right 84 pounds which is the cost of putting something over a gate because we don't own our own waste I'd rather that was spent on school books adult social care than it rubbish rubbish is entirely preventable it's not something that anybody really needs we don't want that being diverted to anywhere other than where it's needed as a local authority so my ask to, to you, Councillor Pritchard, and your residents is tell us 
tell us and work with us. So, you know, make this unacceptable. Make this something that actually is that your environment is something you care about and you want to be invested in. But better than that, make it something that you've got a plan to make it something more valuable than it currently is. But that's, I think, I shut up because there's not a lot you can say about fire tipping, which isn't ugly. Thank you, Louise. Um, right, so um, <laughs> I'm going to open up for any other contributions now. Um, oh, is that, yeah, Ray, go on. You'll have to unmute. I reported some uh, rubbish at the bottom of my garden. Been on for three years ago now, and the local residents as well, in, in one of these passageways between the houses. So it's probably drops in the way, what they may say, drops in the middle. But I've reported it several times, and it's still there. There's two two glass uh, shower doors, and a, and a, and a lot of bags of rubbish. You know, but I've reported it, and nothing's been happened about it. Yeah, and that's because of the artificial lines I just explained to you about it being on private land. So, so and then this is what the Love Your Street money we really battled with. That actually, when a resident yeah. sees that what they see is a problem, they don't care whose land it's on, they just see a problem. So, so that's what we've moved to get this um, one city approach to. It's not going to be easy. There are over 4,000 unadopted roads in Birmingham, the little alleyways between areas where everybody knows if you just put it there, no one's going to prosecute you because it's not owned by anybody particularly and they can get away with it, but it's a blight on everybody's neighbourhoods. We absolutely accept it, that that's what's going on. We've been, um, uh, our hands have been tied in as much as what we've been able to do before now, because of the way that funding and seed cleansing and what our statutory responsibilities are. And our statutory responsibilities can be really clear, are highways maintained at the public expense. So when you pay your council tax, and a bit of it goes to this, it goes to the pavement. It doesn't go to the tiny bits of road. We've accepted as a local authority that's not good enough for people's lives. And we're trying to do something about it with this new initiative. So, yeah, we will be relying on you to tell us where those areas are. But equally, we'll be asking you to help police them too. So, I, um, <coughs> thanks, Ray. I think, um, and, and those are the response. I think um, probably be helpful if if people have particular things they'd like to see and particular solutions they've got that they think they would be good that I would really suggest like those to that. tonight or, or another point um and yeah i mean particularly on that that point for example about uh, cameras you know where you think we should we should target those for example and and you know we, we push and lobby to get those in the places that are needed um so yeah i suppose um i think i think ray's point is very much Residents are probably reluctant to slightly play their part to a certain extent because they see it as up till now they've reported for three years and it's never been dealt with. So what's the point? So I think that's 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 probably also the and, and some of this Richard, is, is going back some years. I probably cancel a lot of phone. My phone's been going off all night. Some of this is going some back years when we sold off quite a lot of housing properties, and because we did that, the bits in between were were left off. So what you're left with is these bits, this unadopted road and orphan pathways that actually, as local authority, we've got to get ourselves yeah. in, in front of. It, that's not been the easiest. Task. Um, and I think Councillor Bridal did a report, I think, two and a half years ago, actually, thinking about it. And there was nearly 3,000 of those roads. And some more gathered than others in areas. But where there's big housing land, those, those little bits of alleyways between the two of the ones that actually fell off the agenda. They're not highways maintained by the public expense at all. They never have been. They're just not owned by anybody. And that's what we've got. We've, we've moved to a position where we've gone, this isn't absolutely about who owns what land. This is about people's environments and what we can do as a local authority to improve them. So it won't, will never be a priority because we've got statutory duties, they come first, but we've got to find a way of dealing with them. So, um, Ray, go on, I think you were going to say something else. Yeah, good. well, actually, you know, I, I own my house, so I, do I own half that walkway behind my house? That's a really interesting question. Depends on the walkway. Yeah, the, the, yeah, bungalow it, it really the, does. Side, the bungalow the other side of me is a, it's a council rented bungalow. It's I a really I know, interesting question. 
I think I know the alley where you where you live, Ray, and I think that's still council. I'm pretty sure that's still council. So those those alleyways, a lot of them, they don't come up. So, so Louise is right. They do not come up as highways, but they do still come up as council as housing owned. So I, I'm think so in the, on the Jersey the state, a lot of those are still housing owned. They yeah, were, they and, and, and the bigger ones are also highways. The bigger paths, the, the widest of the stuff is more obviously paved. And and this is where it gets really, really difficult because actually what you're saying is this is council arguing with council. And we said two years ago, we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to sort it, which is why we've got this money. You're absolutely right. Whether it's council housing and pennies, or whether it's highways up and, and street scene, or whether it's highways in Kia, or actually you're looking at one council going, I don't care, can you just sort it? There are there are lots of those things around, and, and I'm not responsible for Jewish Heath because just I'm responsible for the entire city. There's loads of them, so, so the, yeah, this is a big challenge for us as street scene to deal with. But we're not beyond that. Actually, we're quite big, you know, got big high vis gear that we're happy to put on and have a go. So we're quite happy to do that. One of the things that's going to come back to you as residents and as a councillor, sorry, is what are your priority areas? Because I can only eat this elephant one chunk at a time. So it's got to be really clear about where our, our things are. So we can start attacking those. Proving that it works, might not work, might get worse, I don't know. But we've got to start doing it and then see where we can get progress made in, in the right places for the right reasons. I will go back to, and, and Danny, Danny's point about all of this is absolutely right, the people that are dumping it is the problem, not who's picking it up. We can have things there every day at a huge expense, actually, because it's their cause, running across the gate. But actually, what we've got to start doing as residents, tackle the behaviour. I, I, I come from Birmingham, and, and, and the part of Birmingham I was from, just didn't get away with it, because somebody would be going, I, I know your mother, and I'm telling her, you've just done this. And for this community, as a kind of... We, we kind of need to get it back to a place where we are all own our environment a little bit more. So, um, it doesn't Ray, matter. Ray, was there something else you wanted to add? Go on. No, no, that's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> is there any way you think is a particular... Um, Ray, do you think... Oh, spot, I mean, oh, as you mentioned, obviously, your back alley. But are there any... around? If you think around the state, where do you think the big hotspots? If you were going to say, we need some cameras there, where would that be? Well, but... Um, down the back lane. Jimmy's Lane. Jimmy's Lane, the regular, you know, where it goes down the hill. Quite often there's, uh, there's mattresses and that chucked out there. Yeah, Drew, I, 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 get, I, get, I, I, get reg, uh, yeah, I get regular complaints about Jimmy's Lane from different people. Because no, they're I, I not seen that. from how any, the, there's all the trees and the bushes that people can't see them from the housing. Right, uh, that's a pretty hard. I'm, I'm deaf and I'm having to read and sometimes can't. Did you say Drew would say? Yeah. Okay. All right. back, the, the, back added, the added problem with Drew's Lane is oh. you've got multiple things. It's it's the edge of the city. So the other side of Drew's Lane is Worcestershire. Yep. Um, and it's countryside. And as, as Ray said, on top of that, it's all, you know, the verge is often, bits of the verge are also quite um, overgrown and bracken. Yeah, I, I, know, I, know, I do know Drew is saying, and I do know that, that actually, frankly, it has the same issue with people driving in their environmental crime because it's easy, it's right on the border. And sometimes it's about, I can't actually be bothered to make it to the HRC. It's easier to dump it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Is there anywhere else? You I mean, I agree with you, Drew's Lane, particularly that dip bit, yeah, is, is a real pain. Yeah, um, anything else you can think of? There's, there's, a, there's not, not turned it up on, on a, a regular basis. That's good. That... As Danny said, it's the, 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 quite often it's the down the bottom of the tower blocks, people just seem to dump it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ray. I think yeah, I think uh, Drew's Lane definitely, Tower Block definitely, and there are certain alleyways I can I can definitely say that from my perspective that I've um, I, I spot regularly. Um, Denise or, or Rachel, I just want to know where you haven't had a chance to speak. So I just want to see if there's anything you want to, to talk about and raise here at this point. I I just put something in the chat. Yeah. So you're yeah, Jamie. I mean, you want to do you want to want to say it? Oh, um, just would it be of any benefit to reintroduce free um, large work, free 
collections of large waste from the council um, and making it easier to access the recycling place um, down on Lifford Lane. Just it's, I know we can book appointments, so that's taken away the queues, but there must be so many wasted slots. Um, they fill up really quickly and you can't cancel it if you can't then make it. And I'm sure there are many people that are not allowed, that are not able to make their appointments at the moment because of COVID. Um, so there are all sorts of things that are actually making it very difficult for people to get rid of their waste. And you've got the obvious thing that where people might have once taken stuff to charity, they can't do that at the moment. And they're just trying to clear their houses. Okay, um, Denise, did you, um, before I bring Louisa Danny back in, D Denise, was there anything you wanted to, to raise here? Um, not really, no. I think um, there's a lot of problem with sort of more graffiti. Um, I've noticed just slightly, but um, you know, that seems to be all over the area. Um, yeah, and I, I was just really listening to all the, just to get an idea of what was going on with the tower blocks and all that kind of thing. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Denise. Is there any particular hotspot for graffiti that you, you sp the, the, the spotted? Um, well, I've just noticed I'm more around the sort of all sister road, Marsham Road, Meadfoot, and it started to um, appear on some of the walls of the shops and um, and going up towards the Maypole, I've just noticed recently, there seems to be more than ever. Um, okay, so it's a more a main road thing if you're spotting a graffiti, like on the Ulster yeah, Road? Uh, yeah, and sort of on the corner by where the shops are, sort of the, um, by Midfoot Avenue, that area. Brilliant, yeah. thank you. Um, one thing I was thinking, um, and, and I think that Danny was possibly thinking as well, was when we can, like from the 29th of March onwards, was trying to really get out and do some big community kind of push on, on doing some cleanups and, and do a community cleanup day type stuff. Um, do you guys, um, particularly here, um, think that would be a, a good call? You know, Denise, Ray, Rachel, would that work with something you'd like to get involved in? Um, and is that kind of something we can probably maybe kickstart with, with a lot of promotion, you know, try and make it, I've done, I've done smaller ones myself, you know, quite easily, but in terms of trying to make it a bit bigger and a bit more, you know, you have several different points people can can do it in different groups and so you, you know, you're not getting big crowds together kind of thing but um is that something a do you think would be good trying to do doing a big community day and b would you like to to, to get, jump in and get involved yeah times yeah yeah right what do you think you need to unmute sorry i muted everybody again because there was a um, bit of feedback yeah it's a good idea but my personally my my health wouldn't let me do it anymore. I'd be, I'd be falling over and then people hadn't pick me up because I go dizzy after a bit. It is a good idea, you know. Brilliant. Um, Rachel, do you want to add anything on that one? Um, so, yeah, on the tip stuff, um, I, yeah, it does need to be made easier. Um, I... There's definitely a little bit of tension and, and maybe not conflict, but tension between those residents who live near Broadmeadow Lane and they're obviously that's the other part, that, you know, the other bit of my water, you know, talking, and who had to deal with her endless queues um, and are now really glad they're gone. Um, and so there's that tension between that and that's what you had even before COVID in some summer weekends, it was still pretty bad on, 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 on the queues or down there. And people, um, you know, are glad those are gone um, and appreciate that. Um, and so a kind of free fall again, particularly at the moment is like when, when there's a lot less capacity at the tip because of the social distancing restrictions is, you know, people are like, uh -uh, no, we don't want, we don't want that. And I, I can completely get that. And I think at the, mo certainly at the moment, keeping the booking system is the right decision, but I think you're absolutely right. Certainly from my perspective as a counselor, I think the booking system has too many barriers. I think not being able to cancel, um, not being able to book by phone is a, is a, is another one that's a real, a real, I think a real bugbear of mine. Um, because I, you know, people are like, oh, I'm not online. Um, and, and particularly in, in, in our area, there are quite a lot of people online. I get a lot of my case work by phone rather than email. Um, and that is a, it is a thing. Um, and yeah, the kind of how far in advance you can, people go, oh, I work go on, there aren't enough slots. Um, you know, in terms of how many slots you can have and how far in advance. Can I answer some of that? Can I answer some of that? 
Yeah, I was about to, I was just kind of wrapping up on that one. Um, Ray, did you want to say something before I come back on that before I, I bring Louise in or, or Danny back in? No, no. No, okay. Brilliant. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think that's uh, definitely on that. On the free book you waste, uh, Rachel, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think there may now be some movement, certainly if you're on lower incomes or, or on, on benefits, you may be able to get some, some help with that now. Um, oh, that, that's going to come in. So that may help a little bit, um, but um, yeah, I, I yeah I agree on that on the free bulky waste. Um, it again is another another barrier. But yeah, I think lowering the barriers to booking the tip would would really help. And that's more bookings for longer in advance. That's being able to cancel. That's being able to phone. Those three things I think would 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 really help. And absolutely, I'm, I've raised it before, and I'll keep definitely keep raising it. Um, I'll let Louise come back on that one and, and anything else she says differently, and then I'll bring Danny back in. So, so literally, um, you're you're all right. Absolutely all right. Um, the problem, the problem with big bulky waste is that uh, I, I don't know if any of you know what happens to our waste, the residual waste of recycling. It goes into an energy recycling facility. It gets converted to energy. It can only cope with two thousand tons of waste. That's all the turbine can cope with. We are producing 2,100 tonnes a day as a city. As such, anything over that goes into landfill. We don't want that. We want more recycling. So, so the issue around big, bulky waste is more about us as consumers having, by definition, more waste to deal with, which we've never had before. Everything comes in like 14 layers of something. Or so as, as a community, 20 years ago, when this contract was negotiated, we expected everyone to produce about 800 kilograms a week of waste that's way more than it ever was the free bulky waste is going to be how birmingham funds that because at the moment the energy recycling turbine is a big place can only cope with two thousand if birmingham residents are going to come up with four thousand you've got to come up with landfill money now i don't know about you i i grew up in care in birmingham i'd rather money went on education and it's on rubbish and and there's some questions we've got to ask ourselves as residents about that you're absolutely right about the booking scheme, actually, Councillor Pritchard. And I have noticed I'm taking that to Darren tomorrow and I'm going to say, why can't we do this? This is a contract we're in that should be easier. But the other thing I would say, which is, is mostly around what we do as residents, is that I, I get that I've quite enjoyed walking and I do this thing where I do a bit of litter picking with my cockapoo, he's a bit of a nutter, mostly because I don't want him to eat face masks and stuff. But some of us are well enough to do it and some of us aren't. The question isn't about what we it should be, how we react to it. It's whether we let it happen. So when we next see somebody drop something, what do we say to them? I remember when I was little, being out with a social worker, and she went, I'm so sorry, you just dropped that. And she said, you can pick it up. So this is about the nuances around how we treat our environment and actually where we are as, as a country and a society in terms of our energy sustainability. We cannot afford to put more things into landfill. We just can't. We are a disposable society now, which is terrible, but actually in very real terms, if you're buying a bed, somebody will take it away if you're sensible about it. There was lots of people that would take advantage of that, of course, but some of that starts with our acceptability about that. I am recycling this milk. I'm not putting this milk plastic carton. I'm not putting in my residual waste. So there is, there is some bottom lines on this, which is quite fine but they're not ones that we can't overcome by some of our behavior and how we tolerate other people's behavior that sounds like a lecture i'm sorry didn't mean it to sound like a lecture no no thanks thanks Louise. um danny do you want to kind of respond to anything that the, of the issue that things have been raised there look louis louis i've worked with louise for a long time you know and, and this is not my first fight with fly to be you know i was in the great battles of Bordesley green and washwood heath four or five years ago and we think we've got a fly tipping problem there we were picking up 50 ton not three ton you know and, and there is only one way in my eyes to fight this battle and that is to take the area back we need boots on the ground in fluorescent vests we need kids from the school picking litter up people need to know that if you want to dump in boards of green then somebody's going to take your registration and we're going to have you the next day we need to make it fortress board, fortress druid's feet, that people are not coming here as a soft touch to, to dump. You know, let's. I was going to say let's push them to Kings Norton, but let's not because I cover that and all. You know, let let <laughs> let let we we need, <laughs> we, we need to make it that you come to druid 
to tip, we're going to get you. You know, let's. That is the only way. It's going to get tipped. It is. You know, Drew Lane. I love that because after that's Worcester. <laughs> I dance when I see it over there. I do. My lads actually <laughs> over that side. They don't. They don't. <laughs> but yeah. It, it's hey, genuinely done, eh? No, I'm only joking with that. I've lifted a leg of that. It's, it's a battle, but it's a community battle. It's not a council battle. Uh, and it, it's got to be four with boots on the ground. You know, not lifting big mattresses. We'll do that. You know, when we have, when we have a litter pig, uh, Louise gives us a truck and I'll go around with the bin men and lift it with them. We're not asking anybody to do that. All we're asking for is somebody to put a fresh and best on with a pair of tongs and pick up two packets of crisps. That's enough for people. Or oh, sometimes work. they just say, we're not having that. Yeah, we're not having that. We're it's not having that. Work. And, you know, Louise, right, this doesn't happen where I live. You know, Cottage Park's opposite me. You drop a crisp packet in there and five people are on you. You know, it's, and that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that people know you drop something in through it and we're going to get you. One way or another, and I've always said that. You know, like that. You know, that that's my way forward. Right. So, on that note of doing some some community work, um, shall we get some dates in a diary of some some community cleanup days and and get that in um, for when we think we'll, we'll we'll be able to um, and kind of get get cracking on that. Um, and I know we'll support you with the resources we've got that coming on stream in the next couple of weeks. Not only will be your community doing that. I've got vehicles, high vis a, a, a kind of whole community response to it. Danny's done one of these things with me before now, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind if, look, he's nodded, wouldn't mind it volunteering again. If we can get a whole, not just residents, but the residents in Orange High Vis, the residents in Orange High Vis and the Kia High Vis, every, and the police and the ASB, we can get everything in one focal point just to go, we're reclaiming our land now. It's ours, it's our community. Okay, so shall we? Um, I'm gonna. How soon, Louise? Is there? Is there a? If I put it in too soon, that's too soon. Or, or if I just put a date in now, we'll just get cracking. Um, and uh, whatever, whatever's good. Cabinet members, let me go back live with this at the end of March. Three weeks. So in that case, shall we? Shall we go? Maybe I don't know. Mid April, so something like seventeenth of April, that, but which is a Saturday. I know Danny's not Saturday's not great for Danny, so so he, he prefer midweek. But so yeah, well, sometimes... you know, some some council stuff are part timers; they just start. Um. So so um. So shall we say then a a maybe a couple of dates in that week beginning the twelfth of April? Maybe do maybe have that have a kind of a a week of cleaning up. Um. I'll double. We might also want to double check the, when the schools are in and out and, and what their abilities are as well. Yeah, well, um, the other thing I will mention is Great British Spring Clean, which we try and do every year, which this year is likely to be in September, which is a really good opportunity. It's, it, it's a long way away from where we're sat at the moment, but it'd be a really good if you could start tracking our journey. We could enter some awards like some of the in bloom stuff around the journey that we've gone to, which would give, you know, it, it gives rewards the community in that respect. So, um, brilliant. So I think yeah, we'll we'll try and aim for that mid-April, a mid-April big cleanup, um, and try and and try and get some of that stuff in train. Um, I think yeah, I would as a start off at ten, I would definitely say if we can get some cameras, I would say obviously around the blocks, but also I think Druids Lane um, is is seen as a soft touch for all the reasons we've said. So I think that would um, um, be also Louise. If I if if you can get some temporary cameras, I'd say blocks. And and Driz Lane, there's probably other places I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, get so, to. So, what I'll say about the cameras is they're a city where we source cameras and pictures. So, we are going to put our jobs in a row about that, make sure that we are not over promising and under delivering, but actually, we're going to do what we say we're going to do. And those are going to be on priority areas. Okay, well, we will keep reporting it and we will create those uh, reports and, 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 and bump up the figures to make sure we get priority then. And uh, that's that's what we'll have to do. We'll just have to keep reporting it to get, to get those cameras. <laughs> nice try. Um, I, I always say to residents, report, 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 because if you don't report it, the council doesn't think there's a problem. So, um, yeah, uh, we, we definitely absolutely. need to, to do that. So just before I go, is there anything, anybody, any of your residents wanted to ask me that I haven't already answered? Any more for any more? Any final, any thoughts or questions before, before we kind of wrap up? No? Okay. Brilliant. Um, so I think that's, that's Danny done as well. So thanks, uh, Louise. Thanks, Danny. Um, so we'll, we'll You're more than welcome. Track. 
you're more than welcome. Um, I'll wrap up that. So yeah, aiming for a action, immediate action is some sort of clean up and in, in mid-April. And if anything also, that comes to you, we will react to obviously. So brilliant. And I'll also the other thing is yes, I will I'll continue lobbying Louise for for those uh, for that camera resource as well. And I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll continue on that one. Um <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Take care. Bye. And uh, for the, those of you left, is there any more things you'd like to? We've got about fifteen minutes left. Um, we can we can wrap up early, or is there anything else you'd like to? Before we do wrap up, anything else you'd like to raise um, while you've you've got me while we're here? No, Denise is shaking her head. Um, Rachel, just about the lights. Uh, the traffic lights it'd be great if we could get those fixed I mean to be fair I've never known them to work in all the years that I've lived here so um because I have I know I've, I've done this before haven't I I've, we've, we've I've looked at this already I think um so remind they said the guys the guys that were here last time said that they would go in and fix it the next day and I think I did see work happening but it was on the lights from one stop across um bramwood road mm -hmm. yeah so which, so, and they weren't the ones that are broken right so which ones remind us which ones are the problem and remind us what the problem is it's from one stop yep towards money hole um so is that crossing can of crossing broad lane if at the very end of broad yes, lane it is. it's crossing broad lane and it's got the island in the middle. Yes, another one. So right. And so, what is the problem? Are they not working at all, or is it that they're slow? The the world's slowest lights, or doesn't work at all. So. So you press it, nothing. Yeah, I mean the the red light is the red light is on to say that yes, you've pressed it. Right. Um, neither the red changes. Neither the red or the green light is lit, but I mean, that could just be a bulb thing. But the the um, panel on the island, um, the, red per the red person stays red the whole time. So we recorded a whole cycle of the lights and it's a long cycle, isn't it there? Um, and it didn't change once. Okay, so let's just let's recap that. So um, the you, you press the button, it does turn red on on the the button. Push. Well, it never it's never not red. It's permanently red. Ah, okay. So it's not it's never off. Is that is correct? That's the, yes. that's a fault. So it's yeah. never off. Yeah, that's a fault. And then on the um, on the lights themselves, the green never comes on and the red never goes off. No, ne uh, on the one uh, by one stop. Neither the red or the green is on. Right. And on the other side, the red is always on. Correct. Okay. And, and in, in terms of the button push, is that the um, same problem um, on, on both or is it just one? I couldn't tell you. I didn't analyse that. Right. Okay. But it's at least on one. And which one is it on? It's on the one by one stop. So the one by one stop, you press the button, the, well, the, the red light's always on. And yeah. that the lights above it never come on, and on the other side of the road they're always red. Yeah. Okay. For the pedestrian crossing, right? Okay, I'll um, I will write to um, the highways contractor again, um, and 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 give them another kicking on that one. Um, yeah. I mean, like I say, I've got I've got a video of it. It's just that, and it's only two minutes long, but I can't send it by email. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I know I'll I'll try and get that that looked at. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. That's really, really, really helpful. Um, Ray, is there anything more you wanted to, to talk about or raise or, or um, get to No, just like? to say that uh, you, you should have seen that crushing with the traffic lights before they put traffic lights there. What was that, Ray? Well, I, I lived, used to live in Brownwood Park Road in the days yeah. when there weren't traffic lights at Broad Lane. Yeah. And when they first put them in, there was nothing but accidents because they put them in wrong. Right, okay. But there are 37 lampposts, sets of lights there. I guarantee it the ones. Mm. So you'll probably yeah. find this, Janet. And the, third, the firm that put them in went bust. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Brilliant. Well, I'll yeah, I'll um, I will give give um, Kieran another kick in on that one and, and try and try and sort that out. So um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. That's helpful. Any more for any more before we we kind of wrap up and bring this to a to a close. Oh, Rachel, go on. Sorry, so I've just remembered there was one thing my daughter asked me to bring up. Uh, mm -hmm. I I can understand why this might not be possible for many reasons. However, her request is. Could we please have lights in the Money Hole Hall Park? Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, I mean, I know the answer I'm going to get back from parks on this, which is yeah. no, because we haven't got any money. Um, what yeah. I, I, I think is always useful with these sorts of requests is to at least make the case in terms yeah. of building a case and and kind of trying to show that we do we need them and want them and people want them. Um, yeah. So when the money is there, we yes. know we're def the, 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 the council kind of is confident that people definitely want that, you know, particularly when, when money's scarce. So I'm wondering whether maybe when, when restrictions are lifted, you know, if, if your daughter wants to do a petition about it and or, or, <laughs> or that sort of thing and try and maybe gauge what the reaction is and what, what people would want. And, yeah. and, and that then kind of starts building a case for it, if you, if you see what I'm saying, in terms of yeah. in that, that um, you know, yeah support for it really um yeah. i mean I've, I've got i've got a resident again on the monohill estate he was um writing to me about having a dog agility playground in uh, somewhere on on in on, on the parkland there um and again it, i've got a similar sort of kind of immediate comment well you know what the parks department will say there isn't an immediate bit of money for it however mm. if we can show this community support then yeah. when we do see a bit of money or you know there's there's yeah, yeah bits of here or bits there we can kind of couple together or find then you know you can kind of go well actually that's something we can we can kind of do and we can yeah. you know we've got a ward plan for example that um you know doesn't have those specific projects in it but it, it could do the next iteration if we if we do that as well and again if, if something's in the ward plan you've got more if there is any cash around anywhere you've got more chance of saying abuse on that if you've already agreed it as part of you know the things you want to do so um yeah, yeah that's possibly what i'd suggest for that um i know that's not um, maybe the answer she wanted straight away, but um, you know we can, yeah, we can. I'm happy to you know work with her maybe and try and as a build the case and you know keep hammer on the door of the parks department to, to you know to make that happen long term. Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, if there's nothing else, I want to say thanks for coming. Um, I'll probably will do you know try and do another one of these um, in a couple of months um and yeah do kind of let people know if if you know people you know want to come to these things or want to find out what's going on locally and want to discuss issues and raise issues do let people know about it um and and share the links um and get them along um yeah we we don't quite have the attendance that we did when we were having them in person i remember one in-person meeting we managed to get like 60 people one time so um, uh, um it's it's not quite the same um but i think yeah the more we spread the word the more we kind of um try and get that word of mouth and, and get people sharing it the more chance we've got of, of kind of getting getting people along um and interested um and yeah together we can get some solutions and try and get some action on on these issues so um yeah please do encourage and get people along next time if you can um yeah so probably next one in probably be here in i'll do it in, in a month or two um and in the meantime yeah thank you very much for your time really appreciate it um for you know for logging on tonight um and if there's anything you need in the meantime yeah i think you've all got my contact details um so just send me an email give me a call um and i'm i'm more than happy to to try and help and support them and um you know look into whatever it is or trying to make something happen and thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheers, Councillor. <clears throat>